Hello, welcome to Statistically Insignificant. Yet again, it is a podcast of slides. It is nominally about statistics. I am Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and with me, never free from this hell, it's Bart. Hi, Bart. Hey, how's it going? And I go by he and him, and uh, this week I'm drinking mid-strength beer and wearing jorts, so let's see how that affects the energy that we've got going here. Oh, very 90s of you. <laughs> <laughs> with us as well is our second guest, Anders, who is an Australian ex-MMA judge with a Brazilian jiu-jitsu background, and we're going to be talking to him specifically about mixed martial arts. This is a follow-up episode to our episode on fight statistics. How are you going, Anders? I'm good. Thank you for having me on. Pleasure to have you here. Are you ready to get extremely red and angry? <laughs> I am. It is uh, the default nature of an MMA fan. <laughs> <laughs> so in this episode, as I that we are going to be talking about MMA. In the previous episode, Fight Statistics 1 with Shane Greenwood, we talked about how the scoring system for MMA was basically adopted from boxing. So in boxing, we have what's called a 10-point must system, which means that for each round, you can at most score 10 points. Typically, the winner does. The loser can score at most 9 points. In boxing, they also have formalized that if somebody gets knocked to the ground, uh, that is if their glove touches the ground or if they fall to the ground another way, that counts as a point against them. So you can have 9-8 rounds, you can have 9-9 nine, nine rounds where they are evenly split. Anders, could you tell us how this got adopted into MMA and what it looks like in there? Uh, this got adopted into MMA as part of the kind of formalization of MMA as a sport, which was really spearheaded by the UFC. And as part of doing that, uh, they were very strongly ba moving to be based in Las Vegas at the time. Right. And so Las Vegas, obviously, one of the homes of the biggest boxing matches. Yes. And so they picked up the 10-point must system as, I suppose, an easy way of building upon the existing rules. Mm. The 10-point must system in MMA, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with it. I suppose would be the best way to put it, but it is repeatedly showing its flaws and not being implemented correctly. Yeah, so what we were talking to Shane about and what it seems to me that this system represents is a concept of effective damage. And that has a, I won't call it um, rigorous meaning, but a generally a meaning that you could observe in practice in striking sports, right? And one that I'd say is generally understood by all boxing judges. Yeah. So uh, one of the papers you showed me actually indicated that boxing judges are reasonably consistent. They have a high level of agreement on most uh, individual rounds. There are some disagreements, of course, and there's measurement error and everything. But overall, reasonable consistency. Yes. Consistency is something that has definitely been lacking in MMA judges uh, through history. Mm. And that's definitely been one of the key points of contention about the 10-point must system, uh, because there are so frequently rogue scores, as I suppose you could call them. Okay, what do you mean by a rogue score? You mean a judge who disagrees with the others in some fundamental uh, way? Certainly. Uh, yeah, you will have, say, a fight scored 30-27 to fighter A. Yep. 30-27 uh, to, to fighter B. Yeah. And then there would be the third judge who might, say, have a 29-28 to fight at A. Right, okay. So you've got two people who are very different, one person kind of in the middle. Yeah, and it's not unheard of for there to be a split decision where all three judges have scored at 30-27. Right, um, but two I... different people, or...? Yes, okay. the, where two have scored at 30-27 one way and one yep. has scored at 30-27 the other way. So specifically... Uh... Oops, that should be 27. This is what happens when you have three rounds. Uh, each round has up to 10 points in this 10-point must system. And so you have a judge saying one person has won all three rounds, the other person has lost all three rounds, and but they disagree about who won all three rounds. That's correct, yes. Okay. I understand um, Japanese pride fights were also big in the development of MMA. Did they have a different scoring system? They did, and I'm so glad that you've brought up Pride, Bart. Ooh. Uh, because <laughs> Pride uh, is... Not just parading different... in the street, I assume. That's right. No, 
first off, pride never die. Uh, get that out of the way. But second is that pride used a completely different scoring system. And there's two main reasons for this. Their scoring system was a whole of fight score, where at the end of the fight, the ju if there hadn't been a stoppage, the judges would just render their score for the entire fight and decide on a winner. There were, it was not round by round. Right. The two reasons for this, uh, the first one is arguably it provides a better overview of the entire fight, especially given that Pride had a 10-minute first round and then a 5-minute second out. round. <laughs> I've sparred for like two minutes in boxing and that's exhausting as is. Bloody hell. That's it. So it, it's hard to kind of do a weighted round score. In yeah, that. for sure. So uh, what, sorry, real quick, I've never heard of Pride before. What is the sort of, is this a particular combat system? Is it just generally people fighting? What's going on here? Pride was the biggest uh, Japanese fighting, like mixed martial arts fighting event. Okay. Uh, and due to the time it was operating in, when the UFC was really in the doldrums, Pride was enormous. Uh, and they had incredible... F Fights ranging from the kind of technicians that you would never get to see in the UFC because the UFC wouldn't book these kind of fights through to the most grotesque freak show matches. Okay, well, what can you give me some like description of what those would be? Uh, that might be a kind of, <laughs> for example, a kind of 600 pound ex boxer versus a welterweight kind of thing. Right, okay, so there were not controls on things like weight classes. No, and this is right. this is where we get into the second reason that Pride had this scoring system. And I'll put a big allegedly at the front of this, <laughs> and that is corruption. Ah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Because if the judges have just have to decide on the winner at the end of the fight, without uh, any... Ever, you know, yeah, yeah. That's right. It's mm. very easy to say this fighter won the fight. Uh, and there certainly were a lot of not great dealings happening in Pride throughout its history. <laughs> So was it yeah. more like um, judges betting on matches, or was it more like um, being there kind were, of... Uh... There were allegations that Pride was a wholly owned and operated uh, by the Yakuza kind of thing. Oh, I'm shocked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's just like a lot of mixed martial arts all around the world mm. are run by similar organisations because they are the ones that tend to have a lot of cash to burn on holding events. Mm. Uh, and we'll also often have a lot of people on their own books who are keen to gain combat skills and experience. Yeah, right. So what this tells me is that, for one, there have been different scoring systems used across MMA. But they also, have, yeah. yeah, but also, like, as we're going to, again, suck all the fun out of this and reduce it to a system being measured, this this idea of effective damage really does change when you introduce the grappling. Because... Well, they're radically different ways of fighting people, right? Throwing punches or kicks or whatever as a striking sport has a different physicality to it in terms of the effect on an opponent to grappling, but also, like, visually very, very different. This is where the majority of the criticism of the 10-point must system in MMA comes from. It's from, I suppose, what you could best call the lay and pray era. Mm. You had an era where... People were coming out of wrestling programs in the US colleges who were exceptional wrestlers, and they may not have had a great deal of skills elsewhere. Mm. And unlike basketball and football programs from the, and others in these colleges, there's no real Olympic route yeah. for all but the tiniest group. There's no real professional sports scene. There's a professional wrestling if you wanted to go that way. A few started seeing mixed martial arts and the kind of burgeoning UFC in America as the chance to make money continuing to do what they did. Right. And we had this, I don't want to call it a glut, but you had a lot of kind of corn-fed Iowa hulks <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. coming into the UFC and their techniques would generally consist of being able to throw a haymaker really well. Yep. But even better than that, they a could corn take people down. Yeah. Right. They, they could get people onto the ground because these were yeah, wrestling champion, experts, yeah. championship wrestlers mm. going up against people who they might have been kickboxing Muay Thai people. They may have been from various 
you know, jujitsu disciplines. So suddenly having someone who can come in and just grab onto a single leg takedown and drag someone onto the ground and just smother them and keep them in position, mm. they start winning fights. And they start winning a lot of fights this way. Right, so you basically have the, um, I imagine it's called lay and pray because you're basically lying on top of them. That's right. Okay. Because the Brazilians were skilled at that really early on, right? Well, their techniques more came from the fact that they would take someone onto the ground and you put a boxer on the ground and they've got no idea what they're doing. And you can <laughs> very and you can very rapidly grab a submission and win that way. So specifically what you mean is that your Brazilian jiu-jitsu as a is more inclined to go for choke holds, arm bars, leg bars, joint locks, things that cause like you to pass out or cause pain, as opposed to just lying on you and pinning you down. That's right. Okay. Because that that the pin is the primary method of point scoring in wrestling. Right. That is okay. what they have trained towards, and they're very very good at it. Yeah. And obviously, having it, so many fights going to decisions, even big championship matches, going to these slogged out five round decisions where in the first 30 seconds of a round someone is just taken down and they can do nothing about it and then they are just smothered by a wrestler Mm. for the remaining four and a half minutes of each round it's not very appealing to the fans right but it is also the question of if you have taken some to the ground and then you do nothing with it is that that effective effective damage yeah well it, it is an interesting question so with respect to internal scoring within a sport, what does Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu do in terms of scoring? Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has, for the majority of its competitions, open scoring. So a referee will be watching the two people who are grappling, mm-hmm. and as each move or attempted submission is done, a score will be announced by the, by the ref. And they will indicate it. Okay, so So you you have your submissions, which are when somebody taps or passes out, but you also have specific moves that are... So could you talk a bit about what moves mean in this context? Starting from the feet, uh, a takedown or a throw will score you two points. Yep. Then a sweep, which is where you move from a kind of disadvantage to an advantage position, generally by kind of rolling someone over or from your back. Mm. Uh... That will score you two points. Passing a guard, which is escaping a slightly advantaged position, or quite advantaged position <laughs> for the opponent, yeah. gets you points. Achieving everything gets you points, and they are known at the time that you do them, because they have to be announced by the referee. Okay, so there are particular positions that you can get somebody into or get out of that are, indicate a score has been made, or, or a That's point. Right. Okay. This is radically different to the way that striking sports work and that's i think a real problem in trying to score both within the same fight because well for one thing um what little i have seen of brazilian jiu-jitsu there are a crew of them at my gym it is a much slower tempo than striking sports so that enables you to have this where you instance where you score particular moves and particular forms whereas in boxing Counting the number of hit of uh, punches that hit, as we discussed in the fight statistics one, that's really really hard. It's harder from if you're doing it live too, and if you're in the ring because you may not see everything. So already there is the kind of must system in boxing, for example, is an abstraction from the measurement of individual strikes or defense or whatever, because for a human standing there it's virtually impossible to do that accurately to measure the strikes no there's no way i believe that even the best boxing judge would be able to keep up <laughs> any kind of live tracking of strikes yeah in absolutely some of, some of the lightweight fights that you will see yeah yeah for sure <laughs> yeah certainly you're never going to see the kind of volume of maneuvers mm done in any kind of grappling event to compare with the volume of strikes that you would see. Yeah, so this is, to the statistician's eye, a kind of fundamental issue with the relationship between the measurement system and what you're trying to look at. So your measurement system being the scoring and the system being the fight. I I don't know if it would be 
possible to reconcile this easily because like as you say you can't really have judges observing and scoring every strike is there a role that something like slow motion could play in this because i do know that a bunch of boxing statistics sites have people go through title fights after the fact is there any possibility like to have judges, rather than trying to score live on the striking side of things, or even the whole thing, like after a after the first round has run, for example, they sit down and they go through it in slow motion while the other rounds are going on. I know that this would interrupt the flow of information in the sense that you get less of a feel for what's going on if, if indeed the scores are announced between rounds. And also after the fight, there would probably be a fair gap between the end of the fight and the score being announced. Would that and be- I think that that would make it not impossible, but very unpleasant for any promotion to try to... Yeah. We've got a couple of conflicts here. We have conflict between the measurement and the fight. We have like conflict between the promotion and the measurement system. Because, you know, you always want results fast. That's the optimal way to go. And as an entertainment product, it's very difficult to get accurate information fast or something like this. Yeah, and again, at a certain point, you do have to ask what you're actually assessing. Yeah. Because this this is where I feel like a lot of the 10-point must system's flaws through that through the, the years have been compounded by failures of, offic- of officiating both in the ring and by judges. Okay, so as in by the ref and by judges. That's right. Okay. How much of the sport is done on the on your feet using strikes compared to how much is grappling? I mean, this the saying is the fight starts on the feet because every round you start standing up. But from that point, you will have fights where people never go to the ground. You'll have fights where people immediately go to the ground and everything on the spectrum in between. Right. Because as fighters are matched up against each other, People may see perceived strengths and strengths and weaknesses where they might believe that there's no way I want to go on the ground with this person, so I'm going to do everything to keep the fight standing up or vice versa. Right, because I imagine if you have a fight between a, a boxer and a, a wrestler, the boxer is not going to want to be on the ground with that guy or woman or whatever. Not at all. And, yeah. and this leads into, I think, one of the failures of officiating over the years. Uh, say there is a boxer who gets taken down by a wrestler in the opening seconds of a round, they kind of throw one ineffective punch, and the wrestler's already kind of underneath them, got their hips under control, and they're on the ground. Mm. The boxer, in this case, they are stuck there. They don't know how to escape from that position. They don't know how to stand back up from that position. Mm. And so it is perceived as a failure of the wrestler to finish the fight at that point, that they're not putting on any aggression they're not trying to stop the fight okay so the the wrestler has the boxer pinned but isn't if you will doing anything with it that's right but okay. by the same time i see it as the responsibility of the person who's on their back on the ground in that losing position to get yourself out of that position i suppose this comes down to a question of what is a victory in a fight is it to simply restrain your opponent or cuz like, restraint is not the same thing as damage. And that's, I guess, a, a big issue I see here, particularly if you bring into question things like workplace health and safety for the fighters themselves, right? The health and safety of the fighters is a huge, huge issue that yeah, for we'll sure. probably get to as we cover off on some of these points. Because, obviously, as, as a fan, one of the reasons I stopped really following closely was, like with the NFL, I felt that there was a real lack of will amongst the promotions and the regulators to do anything about the kind of damage that fighters were encouraged to take. Mm. It, it is that thing that there are times when you can say this fight is over and it just it doesn't have to go further than that, but frequently it would. Yeah, so this is one of the interesting things that I wanted to ask about because I haven't watched a hell of a lot of MMA. Not, I don't do that kind of research for this. Oh no, that's too much effort. <laughs> but what I have seen is that, um, so there seems to be a decision point when the, the game that has started upright, somebody gets knocked over, either, either due to a blow, they trip, they get thrown, whatever. That person is now in a vulnerable position and the opponent rushes in to start beating their head, effectively, right? Yep. And... I imagine as a ref, there is a very small window to make a decision there 
about whether the person on the ground is still functioning af- enough to continue the fight, at which point they will presumably get beaten for at least a little bit of time before they can recover enough to fight back. Or if the person on the ground has been incapacitated to the point where you should stop the fight. I imagine that is like a couple of second window and very contentious as a decision point. It is hugely contentious, and in my opinion, you should always err on the side of fighter safety. Yeah. But, of course, even a lot of fighters would disagree with that, because fighters are... Masochistic, by their, say? By their nature, crazy <laughs> people. Yeah. And, yeah, you might have a fraction of a second if someone catches a strong hit, they fall down, and you have a tenth of a second to decide whether or not that person has got their arms out to try to stop the like big diving punch that's coming at them or if they're in a fencing response. Yeah. Well, also, I imagine, like, if the... Uh... So the victor in that exchange, the person who knocked the opponent down, did so in order to get them on the ground to grapple them, because they prefer to grapple than stand and fight, they are then going to go to ground to try and arm lock or choke hold or whatever the person on the ground. And you may or may not be able to decide in time before they, like, if, if you decide to stop the fight at that point, you may have interrupted their game plan in a really major way. That's true. Uh, thankfully, for the most part, where you have these kind of event, those kind of momentary decisions that would need to be made by a referee uh, in the ring, it's rarely going to be the case where someone is going to jump onto an opponent who's just been rocked and stumbled onto the ground and go for some kind of submission. Usually that is your moment to demonstrate kind of dominance and their inability to defend and land a couple of quick blows before the person can fully recover and start defending themselves and force the ref to stop it. Yeah, right. So, sorry, you say defending themselves and force the ref to stop it. If they are successfully defending themselves, would the ref stop it? Generally not, unless the ref believes that they are not effectively defending themselves. That's the key phrase, yeah, right. is effective defense. Okay. So if someone's just going to put their hands up in the air trying to stop the person from getting close or anything, generally doesn't look good because they aren't effectively defending themselves, but if they've kind of got their shell in, head tucked in, everything else, yeah, and are just kind of wearing punches on the fore- forearms and shoulders, then that's, that is effective defense. It's not great, because they're... You're still wearing the force, someone standing, yeah, absolutely. But... <laughs> on the ground with someone standing over them, punching them, but it, it is effective defense in that moment. Do fans of the sport prefer, like, knockouts, or do they prefer sort of long, protracted like matches that go the distance it depends what you mean by fan here (laughs) (laughs) Uh, there there certainly is a large contingent of the uh, fan base who never really believed that anything on the ground should be happening if people are on the ground and they're not kind of throwing elbows or punches the whole time that they're on the ground then they should be stood up and they should start throwing throwing strikes at each other again Right, so these are the people who do not see, like, grappling as a really valid part of it. No, and again, I think a lot of that dates to that, you know, era where wrestlers would just get a fight on the ground and... Sit on somebody. Yeah, and sit on someone. I've done judo before, it's surprisingly effective. <laughs> oh, it, it really it really sucks when someone just has complete control of you on top and... Yeah. You can't... You're not you even allowed to tickle well. them! You can't breathe, <laughs> you just... <laughs> It's horrible. Yeah. But there are also those fights where you might have a five-round fight where absolutely every minute of it has been incredible. Mm. Yeah. So it's it's not... What makes something entertainment is a bit difficult to define in this context. It certainly is. But the, the criteria for judging, I think, laid out pretty cleanly as to what people would want to see. Mm. And it's effective striking and grappling, effective aggressiveness... And fight area control, so effectively controlling how the fight is happening. Mm. So when we talked to Shane, we talked about having a game plan and the ability to implement that game plan. That's it, and that's 100% what the fight area control is. It's making sure that you are the person who is setting the pace for the fight and choosing how it happens. So the ref's ability to kind of get in there and interrupt a fight and get people back up off the ground, that seems to be... That's a lot of power for the ref to have, right? Because I, I imagine that there are quite a few referees who don't have a lot of background in grappling sports, and certainly enough of the crowd that doesn't have a background in grappling sports, that you can have situations where you have two grapplers really going at it and being 
putting up a good fight in a grappling sense. But the judge goes, what are they doing? They're just kind of wriggling around the ground. We have to get them back up, get them back to fighting, in quotation marks, which means striking. That's it. And that has happened in even the largest promotions oh. <laughs> in the biggest <laughs> right. matches. Uh, that often it will be that a judge, uh, that a ref, sorry, doesn't understand what they're looking at. That is far less of a problem than it used to be, thankfully. Okay. Because there are now MMA judges who have trained generally in the various disciplines or they've come up only within the MMA officiating systems. Mm. It's not a boxing judge who's been put in by the commission for where that event is being held, who doesn't know what they're looking at on the ground. The crowd is booing. Yeah. <laughs> and so they just say, right, I'll stand it up. <laughs> yeah, so how... I, I imagine that this varies hugely among the different like officials. And I also imagine, as we discussed with Shane, as an official gains experience, they are less receptive to crowd impact, let's say. But how much does the crowd's uh, ability to work out what is going on on the ground, for example, determine how those fights progress? I'd say the crowd plays a larger role in it than they should. Mm. And certainly for the ref in there with the fighters, I feel like the crowd is a huge thing that, that it would be so hard to ignore. Yeah. That if you are watching a fight on the ground where neither person is doing anything wrong, but one person can't do anything right, I suppose might be the best <laughs> way to put it, where that you, you have no reason to stop it, you've got no reason to stand them up, but God, this is boring and terrible. Yeah, right. It's just one person being dominated, the other person is continuing to be effectively aggressive. They're kind of chasing moves and just getting stopped and they move on to the next thing and... Mm. The crowd might like to see it. It might be that exciting because a lot of it might be kind of very fine positional work, trying to shift, kind of shift the position of hips and knees, elbows and everything, mm. trying to attain a very marginal advantage that will let you grab a hold. And that might be truly visible only to a fraction of the crowd. And to everyone else, it just looks like a bum wiggling up in the air <laughs> and someone else on the ground. Yeah, so you have um, you have decisions swayed by drunken 17-year-olds who think grappling is gay. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. In many respects, this is a place where MMA as an entertainment product comes into conflict with MMA as a sporting competition. Uh, and I'll pretty much put it out there that at the higher levels, MMA has never been a sporting competition. Yeah, I, I believe that wholeheartedly. Any time that you have a conflict between entertainment and sporting, the entertainment side wins out every time. It's because they have the money. Certainly, and I suppose even on the smaller regional shows, that's very much the case, where we we'll generally have a smallish crowd in, a, in whatever kind of netball stadium or conference centre or wherever you are holding this event, and if you want them to come to the next show that you run, you need to make sure that you put on a show for them. Yeah. Yeah. And so there will be in all of the pre-fight briefings, everyone's told, you know, finish the fight, never let the never let it go to the judges' scorecard. If you want to fight on this promotion again, oh, that's yeah, that does come into conflict a bit with the workplace health and safety as well. Yeah, and there are certainly the smaller the show, generally the more power the promoter has, mm. and I suppose that kind of scales in the other other way as well. That the biggest shows and the smaller shows are where the promoters have a lot of power because you've got either the UFC at one end, they run MMA worldwide now. That's who there is. Yeah. If you want to be making money in in the sport, that's where you have to be. And so if you choose not to go there, then you're limiting your own options. And at the lowest end, if you want to get started, then generally, yeah, you are going to be fighting for maybe $50 show money Yeah. against someone who keeps on forgetting to get their serology results. Ugh, serology? Their blood work. Right, so that they're not carrying transmissible diseases that might cause a problem. That's right. Yeah. I uh, saw, let's call it an elbow-based facial reconstruction in a Muay Thai fight recently. The first professional fight of a guy I know. And uh, certainly, given that he was, he was like mostly covered in the other guy's blood by the end of it, I can imagine that there is a disease risk there. It certainly is. And again, if this is the only promotion in your area and you want to get started, then... Yeah, you don't have much of a choice. That's it. So... I there's nothing new under the sun, right? And we've already talked a bit about this uh, Japanese MMA, which had a different sort of scoring system. What current efforts are there 
to get something better than the 10-point must system? Well, the 10-point must system has been mo modernised, I suppose might be the best word for it, in 2016. Right. Where they made a real effort to not just have 10-9 rounds, mm. but to expand the scope of scoring potential. Because even though a 10-10 round was always possible, it was incredibly rare to see one. Mm. So you're distinguishing a 10-10 tie from a 9-9 tie there? That's right. Uh, the 10-10 round is generally defined as where there is no difference or advantage that you can discern. And that can happen. It can happen for a variety of reasons. It might be that someone has been, one person has been dominant on the feet, but then someone else can take it to the ground and no one can demonstrate an advantage in either space. The person on the feet can get the jab range, but they're not landing big shots. The person, other person can take them down, but can't finish it on the ground. Or it might be two strikers who are good, but no one's standing out in that round. Okay, so what would look like a 10-10 round as opposed to a 9-9 round? Well, a 9-9 round doesn't exist okay. in MMA, short of a points deduction for a penalty. Right. The 10-10 ten, the round, it would be where there is two fighters who are the same. Yeah, right. And I've scored a couple of them, and it will generally be either at the start or the end of a, of a fight, mm. the first or the last round. First round where there's people who are being very hesitant, there's not a lot happening, uh, especially in a lot of regional shows and the lower level, people only fight three minute rounds, mm. which is not a lot of time, especially for the ground game to establish anything. Yeah, because jujitsu is five minutes typically. It generally is, yes. And yeah, then right. you imagine that you don't just have to take someone down. You have to find a way to get past the strikes to take someone down. Yeah. yeah. And so a three-minute round's really hard for a lot of people with a ground background to do anything with. And so you might see a round where there's two people kind of ineffectually jabbing at each other, <laughs> looking looking for an opening to do something. And that's a 10-10 round. Yeah, right. And like I said, at the other end, you might have kind of Again, regional shows that are, that I've judged where you might have two heavyweights in their final round who are just not doing anything to each other other than occasionally clinching and having a breather. Oh, yeah, because <laughs> they're just exhausted. That's it. Yeah. But then you have the 10-9 round, and that's defined as where someone wins the round by a close margin. Mm. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think there haven't been fundamental flaws with the 10 point must system it's how it's been implemented right because the 10-9 round is the default score for some reason even though you have the 10-8 and even 10-7 rounds that can exist yeah for when someone has demonstrated a larger impact on a round mm. right because in boxing the 10-9 round was the one that was the most common from our last episode yeah but also um what you would typically get with 10-8 or 10-7 is that was counting knockdowns. But knockdowns in boxing play a very different role to knockdowns in MMA because in boxing there is no ground game. Yeah. So if somebody gets knocked to their knees or puts a glove on the ground, that counts as a knockdown for the points. But then you get them back up and you start the fight on the feet again. And certainly this is where I think a large majority of rounds that are scored 10-8 in MMA history should probably have been 10-7 rounds mm. because historically it has been the fact it's been the fact that for it to be a 10-8 round someone needs to have almost died yeah right for it to have gotten to that point on the scorecard and in 2016 this is one of the things where they tried to clarify what a 10-8 round is and since then, there have been more 10-8 rounds scored, and there's been more consensus between judges as to when a 10-8 round right. happens. So it won't just be one or t one outlier judge giving a 10-8. It will generally be two or even all three of the judges giving that 10-8 round. Yeah, because to me, if you have some one person scoring a 10-8 round, that is probably showing sufficient dominance that it should be obvious to others. You'd certainly hope so. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Um, was this clarification done at the UFC level and then filtered down, or how was it? This was done to the unified rules of mixed martial arts, which is the it's done by the Association of Boxing Commissions uh, in the United States, and the various athletic commissions in the states will endorse it. Right, and it's kind of become the default rules. 
certain areas will not allow certain parts of it. For the longest time in Victoria, you weren't allowed to have to have a cage, even though that might yeah, right. be defined as a ring area. So any fights in Victoria had to use a ring. I believe in Victoria, elbows were also illegal for a long time <laughs> in mixed martial arts. Oh, they do and- tend to make people bleed a lot, so that you know looks, looks more dangerous. <laughs> They do, but again, it's the idea of is someone getting you know that cut on the brow from an from a well placed elbow while they're on the ground really worse than them getting pummeled in the head yes. for fifteen seconds? Well, so much of this is if you are allowing fighting sports, it is very hard to then put boundaries on what is considered an acceptable amount of damage to show somebody receiving. And I think that is, like, overall, that's a really difficult thing to do in combat sports because I, I I give a shit about the fighters not being, you know, killed in the ring or whatever, but it's very difficult to moderate what goes on there with respect to, to blood and gore and all the rest. No, and especially with the Muay Thai background that forms such a core component of the stand-up game in mixed martial arts. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Elbows and knees are thrown all the time because you can quickly throw an elbow across someone's head from a grappling position. It's very easy to do that. Mm. Close range shots and also you can keep, because you keep your hand up while you are doing so, you still have more defense than you do if you throw a punch. That's right. And fights get bloody quite often and the cuts tend to be a lot worse when you see them because that's the nature of the these strikes <laughs> coming back to the scoring system as well i imagine that seeing blood coming from somebody influences what they score in this how does that play into the grappling all right uh there is not meant to be any real assessment of damage like physical damage from a judge's point of view because it is that thing that you can look at the impact of very of shots, but you aren't in a position as a judge to dis- to say, well, that guy looks really beaten up. Mm. Mm. Because it can be hard. Like, some people, you tap them and they'll quickly develop a nice little bruise. Other people will take huge shots and not show a mark from it. Yeah. And so you have to not judge based on the visible damage, but on what the effect on the fight has been. So the change in demeanour, I suppose. Yeah, the change in demeanour, the way that everything everything the way that everything has gone for the, for that person is i suppose a really reductive way of putting it because the criteria the criteria are tiered you are meant to assess effective striking and grappling and then if you cannot make a decision based on that you'd go down and look at aggressiveness who has been making attempts to do these things mm. and then if you still can't make a decision on that only then should you look at the control of the fight as your kind of final tiebreaker assessment which is looking at who's controlling the kind of pace and place of the fight mm. yeah and so as a judge obviously damage a cut might show effective striking but at the same time it isn't the be all and end all like that might have been one lucky shot in there but it's, that's always the thing in combat sports is one lucky shot is often all it takes yeah <laughs> yes the number of uh, opportunistic knockouts should indicate that <laughs> So I do have a question about this. This doesn't really get at that fundamental issue of trying to marry grappling and striking. because It it certainly doesn't. Yeah, so your your notion of what effective damage looks like hasn't been resolved here. No, and you could argue that you can't include damage as a criteria because effective grappling isn't doing damage, but it can be just as dominant. Yeah, because... Well, unless you allow people to do things like dislocations and break bones or whatever, which I don't think they should, <laughs> but, you know. Well, gen- generally, if it gets to that point, a ref will be stopping it because someone's been too stupid to, to tap. tap. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, and certainly uh, the culture in, in a lot of spaces around MMA encourages that kind of stupidity. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess... The, the idea of having this tiered system where you look at, um, you said the top rank was effective striking and effective grappling. 
but that's not the same as this effective damage idea we've seen here. So no. Okay. It, it, do you think that there is a way to measure effective striking and effective grappling that is not damage based? I think there is, and this is where I believe that one of the biggest problems with mixed martial arts officiating has been the quality of the official. Right. When I came to doing MMA judging, I had done no judging of any combat sports previously. I'd done some umpiring of football in my school years. I'd been a boundary umpire for some of the state for some of the state junior league games occasionally and a whole bunch of lower games. But it's not like I came into it with a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, <laughs> yeah. and a couple of and a couple of kind of Muay Thai belts kind of on the shelf. I came into it as someone who had been a fan for a long time, had seen all of the problems <laughs> with judging, and went, "I can do better than that." <laughs> and so I thought I'd try to do better than that. Entirely fair. This is there exactly was... the attitude that got me embroiled in statistics. By the way, <laughs> so, I empathise. And there were a lot of people in the early days of the sport who came from exclusively one discipline. Mm. And when you get up to the officiating levels, it was almost exclusively boxing. It was boxing commissions who were given the role of regulating mixed martial arts. They would supply the refs, they would supply the judges, and you would have people who could not effectively judge the ground game or even a lot of the Muay Thai and kickboxing game, yeah. Yeah, right. depending on where they where their backgrounds were. And since then, there are now a lot of MMA officiating academies that people will go through to learn just how to do mixed martial arts offici- officiating. And I went through a very early version of that with Pete Hickmott, who's you know, one of the I suppose, leads of mixed martial arts, officiating, regulating, and everything in Australia, where I'd come... I was living in Victoria. I wanted to get involved with it there, and the Victorian Boxing Commission was running it at the time. Oh, no. (laughs) And their their rules were, you need to have a certain amount of kind of shadow scorecards from or other experience before you can get accredited. And because it's boxing being run there, I don't have any boxing background, I'm not getting going to have a chance to get in and really do anything there but I knew a lot of people involved in mixed martial arts in Tasmania so I made some calls I talked to people and I came down would visit friends and would judge at events here as part as part of trips and the first time I came spent several hours watching tape with Pete Hickmott with him asking me to score fights he'd show me a tape from one one of the events he'd done and ask me to score it score it and then justify my decisions I imagine that's a very, very different judging experience to being live at the ring. It is, but it's at a that point, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, it was, I suppose, demonstrating competence. Yeah. yeah. And then from there, it is the thing that you're, especially in Tasmania at a time where it was not regulated very well, if at all, uh, certainly the that has since changed. There are now fairly good regulations here, but I was doing it here because that's where I could get the experience to then demonstrate competence to the Victorian Commission. And th- th- this is, again, one of the problems with mixed martial arts is it has often existed outside of proper regulation and so officiating won't have a great standard for that reason. But I know when I came in, I knew enough about every aspect of it to effectively judge, certainly at the lower levels, which is what I was judging. I don't think I ever, <laughs> that, at that point, should have been put onto anything ho- like higher up, but that's the nature of it. You... You develop the skills as you go, and you get your chance to prove yourself at it. ever higher tiers of fight, generally. In Australia, of course, that's very limited, because there's not that many promotions or events. You know, I was, MMA just seems to be a smaller um, field than, like, boxing or something. It is. There, there was a time when it looked like it kind of might explode and become a really big thing, and then it just didn't, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. But it has remained in a, a large niche. Yeah, so with these kind of structural issues, do you see there being an openness to changing the way that scoring happens? I mean, you did talk about uh, developments on the 10-point must system, but are there other things that can be done with this? And how much do the officials and the structure around it 
how receptive are they to other changes? I think there have been a lot of efforts to change it over the years. Mm. Certainly, once the UFC established a really good officiating crew who would generally travel with them from show to show and be the in-ring official, that really led to more consistent officiating in the ring rather than... So that's the referee. Show. That's right. Yep. Rather than just being whoever would be assigned by a commission. It's the UFC, of course, would have the power to turn up and go, these are the officials we want. And they also generally had the opportunity to do the paperwork and get their preferred people registered in all of these districts. Yeah, well, so much of this as like as like a structural regulatory system is very interesting because... It, it has, as all these things do, grown organically. And then it gets to a point where we go, shit, we need to actually have something a little bit more rigorous. But within that, there's all kind of interests that are conflicting and like struggles in terms of, like, well, the measurement system. If you are going to give a systematic review and restructure of the rules and who you want to be umpiring or whatever else, there needs to be a system which they can use consistently in the first place. Yeah, and there have been a lot of iterations to the unified rules. Uh, there have been a lot of proposed changes that never went through as well. <laughs> but, a lot of people have a single bright idea that they never quite get there. <laughs> that's right. But there are also a lot of proposed changes to the officiating where there was a real push at one time to try to ensure that the officials were MMA officials, that we didn't have boxing officials in there. And that has organically changed mm. yeah. as you've had more people develop skill in MMA judging and the cream kind of rises to the top there somewhat, that over, a, over enough fights you can kind of see who understands what they're looking at and who doesn't. But there are historically some bad judges who would turn up fight after fight after fight in jurisdictions because they were seen as the se the best judges there. Yeah, right. From boxing history, even though they would deliver absolutely atrocious <laughs> MMA scorecards. So there's a, uh, a, a quip in academia that fields progress one funeral at a time. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah. <laughs> I feel like sometimes that's true elsewhere as well. It very much <laughs> is, I'd say. And I'd say it also became a big issue in the United States especially for some of the commissions who suddenly realised that mixed martial arts was their new cash cow, that boxing wasn't making them as much money, and so it became in their interests to start kind of having the personnel and structures in place to support mixed martial arts more. And that definitely led to big changes uh, where promotions could start to go, look, this, is, this judge has turned in like three absolutely ridiculous scores on the last three fights they've done. Do not assign them to us anymore. Like, don't <laughs> let them do MMA shows. And they had the influence to start doing that. Mm. Yeah. You see the first stop in... Uh making this a more rigorous and realistic measurement system is actually to change the measurement instrument to get better judges in there and better refs. Yeah, I think that that is the primary fault because, like I said, it comes back to the fact that there was always the option to do these this much broader measurement of not just the 10-9, but the 10-10 through to 10-7. But the judges chose not to use it. That led to the problem, a lot of the problems. So is there a way within that to, um, well, because your judges are sitting outside of the ring and if you've got people fighting on the ground, it's even harder to see what they are doing than in a boxing match or something that's standing up. Is there a way you think to bring some of that like referee speciality in, in grappling scoring into this? I think, it, I think it is hard to implement that kind of per manoeuvre or position scoring into this because it is such an open system versus anything that you could feasibly do on the striking side because it, if someone gets a mount position holds it for three seconds great points in the bag versus how how then do you say well is a jab one point or is a jab a tenth of a point for trying to break that down i'm mostly thinking like 
in terms of getting information to the people doing the scoring, would it be... Because, like, I'm just thinking of literally what you can see of what's happening on the ground, which the ref can, I, th I think, from what I can have seen, see much better than the judges. I'm wondering if, they, if they're not calling out points, can they call out positions or what is actually going on in a way that could be more useful? I suppose this, the argument that you'd make as a counter to that is any judge should know what they're looking at. Yes, but and it's whether or not they time, can see it. But th that is, again, why you have three judges at three true, different true. points around the ring. Are there... So in, in an MMA, is the ring floor below their... Like, uh, above or within their line of sight? Generally, at the events that I've judged at... Uh, it will be the ring will be about at eye level, the kind of the floor of the ring, mm. and so you will have an incredibly good view of what's going on going on on the ground. And it will often be the case that two judges might be able to see something well, and the third won't be able to see it at all, just due to the nature of the position positions. But this again comes back to how you're meant to score, where merely holding a position doesn't score in it in anything other than that kind of final criteria of control. It is what you are doing with the position that you should be attempting to do more with it. And that should be fairly evident in either the outcome of the fight or ongoing struggles, scrambles, submission attempts that will become visible to everyone. Yeah, well, just thinking about it, like, in terms of, well, the, the effective damage idea, right? And, um... Just holding somebody down is not doing damage to them, realistically. So I am wondering if if you want this to be fundamentally a sport about who is the best fighter, then as in who is the best at dealing damage to the opposition, then you really need to focus more on the techniques and grappling that would lead to submission or lead to damage, which if in effect means submission stuff. So arm bars, all the rest of it. And I wonder if there is a way to score those getting into those positions, even if you don't get a submission out of it. Yeah, and I I personally, I view attempted submissions really highly. Like, if someone gets a submission on and their opponent fights out of it, it's great that their opponent has fought out of it, but I don't see that as a victory for the opponent. I see that as almost like a knockdown that they have been put into this position where they have had to get out of it. And again, this is where the judges bring in biases. I'll, from a BJJ background, I probably see it that way more than someone from a boxing or Muay Thai background might. But I feel over time, more judges should kind of move towards a consensus view on what is and isn't effective, but the problem is that's not written down really <laughs> it, Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, even in something like boxing, there's been, what, like a hundred, probably more? I mean, boxing has such a long history that there has been the time for this, the, these ideas of what effective damage looks like to really develop organically. And I can imagine that's going to happen in MMA over the next, like, 10, 15, 20 years. But that's a very long time to wait <laughs> yeah, the, no, I, the, I don't think you'd want now. to wait that long. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. <laughs> There's certainly a, a lot that can be done, and I think having the more formal training and a lot of there are jurisdictions that are doing a lot of the kind of post-fight reviews of decisions as well. Yeah. yeah, right. Where they are calling in judges, going, "Why did you score this this way?" And if a judge can't explain it, then they're often going to be taken off future cards, they're going to be put back into training, or if it's particularly bad, they might just be told, thanks, bye. Yeah, right. <laughs> mm. uh, it's happen it happened a lot less than it should have, especially early on, uh, and there was definitely a perception for a long time that you could write down any score that you wanted in some of these professional fights, and you'd be back at the next card without a problem. And, and so it... It's a problem at that level for the jurisdictions to fix the various commissions and regulatory bodies who control who the judges are and how they allocate them. And 
I think there are ways of dealing with it, and some of them choose to do it, and some of them don't. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Having the right measurement instrument really does help, it turns out. <laughs> it does. So what other stuff have you seen? Like, what weirdness goes on around this, which would be interesting? One, I think the classic for this uh, was a group called Yammer, which is Y-A-M-M-A. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Were... Young anarchist mixed <laughs> martial arts. Or... <laughs> Young no, <animals>. they, <laughs> they they called themselves Yammer Pit Fighting. Ooh. And so obviously they you know, were trying to play on kind of the edgy angle of that. Uh, but they came in in 2008 and they were that was kind of at the peak of this era where wrestlers were absolutely dominant and it had been years of a lot of wrestlers just controlling the titles in various divisions because they could do what they did. And unless someone landed a beautiful shot and knocked one out, that's what would happen. And that's what would happen. So Yammer's solution to this was to redesign where the fight happened. And they, they, their idea to remove that the risk of a fight just ending on the ground and being a boring match on the ground with one person in control was to put an inclined edge all the way around the edge of the oh, cage. Oh, hell yeah. Creating, <laughs> creating a kind of bowl <laughs> effect. Right, so then you have a skateboarder going through in the middle of the fight doing sick tricks, right? It, it was not nearly as steep or aggressive as that. Uh, it looked more like kind of the uh, foam ramps that you might see at a kid's play centre. Right. <laughs> Just lining the edge of this cage. And at its base, it's not such a bad idea it might might work out unfortunately when it happened it was a terrible idea oh no because because all all it meant was that it was even easier to get a takedown on someone because you just trip them over on it yeah (laughs) you'd push them back into it they'd stumble fall down and and it would straight back to that (laughs) and so yammer had i believe just the one event and we're never heard from again hell yes (laughs) F's in the chat. Uh, well, no, I think it's a really interesting approach to kind of develop a structural change in the system you're seeing, right? You introduce this new element. That's it. And I suppose the other big difference is here is to look at the difference between the unified rules, which has been primarily an Anglosphere development, and Asian MMA, uh, which was led by Pride and has since you've had... Uh, Risen, One FC, and others in the kind of Asia, in Asia, taking on the mantle, and their solution to this, because they started a lot earlier with having a lot of these fights where the UFC was still kind of doing freak shows and getting banned by John McCain. <laughs> um, a freak show that, in his own right. <laughs> that's right. They pride would be having fights where you might have a fairly pure grappler versus you know, striker event, and a grappler would fall straight on their back at the start of the match and just try, just look to drag the person drag the person. <laughs> God, I, I think, I don't know if it's from that, but I have seen a video of a guy basically on, on his back kind of wriggling towards a str- an opponent with his legs oh, in the air. That's Very right. comedic. That, 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 that can happen. It didn't happen often, but the structural solution that Asian MMA had to the problem of a ground fight potentially being boring or a fight going to the ground and not being finished was they allowed very broadly strikes to the head of a ground opponent. Holy shit. <laughs> oh, okay. And so you ha- you would have someone get knocked to the ground and then their opponent would run over and deliver like a field goal kick to their head <laughs> yeah. while they're on the ground. I was going to say, I, I I imagined that all like being stopped in the head, which is... That, that, that happened a lot too. Yeah. <laughs> and so... Hell. I mean, I'm not sure I agree with that approach <laughs> either, given you know, workplace health and safety. No, but it changed the way that the f- fight would go, because you couldn't just do it a lazy takedown attempt and kind of flop on the ground. Because if you're on the ground trying to play a big kind of spider guard game with your opponent, they are just going to kind of <laughs> stomp on your face. <laughs> yeah. Although Which... I, 
So that tells me uh, something I didn't know, which is that in MMA, like in Western MMA, you do have restrictions on how much, how you can hit somebody who's on the ground. There are very strong restrictions on how to strike on the ground. Uh, I mean, things got added to the unified rules over the years. And so I've got a couple of the unified rules in front of me. Uh, number one that was added, no, no butting with the head. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, then you had no eye gouging, biting or spitting. <laughs> yep. Uh, and th- that goes down and you get towards the kind of grounded fighter stuff later in it. But I believe the ruling was that as soon as someone only had two points of contact with the ground, so that was on their f- on their feet or one knee and one foot, you could attack the you could kick or knee the head again. But you could always punch or elbow the head on the ground, uh, barring certain zones, like kind of defined as the the headphones. Any if you're wearing a headset anywhere behind that, in theory, shouldn't be struck. So nothing to the back of the head or the neck. But yeah, certainly, if someone is grounded, they weren't allowed to be kicked to the head. And you'd see people playing with that. And sometimes I wish I could remember the name the the fight it happened in someone was one kind of one foot one knee on the ground and they were just keeping one hand on the ground so they couldn't lifting. get kicked in the head that's right and then occasionally would lift it up put it back down lift up put it back down <laughs> they lifted it up they got kicked in the head just as they put their hand back down and i believe the ref just let it go as a ko because they'd been gaming the system right yeah, yeah. There is a point at which playing silly buggers will get you caught out by the rap is annoyed, yes. That's that's right. But <laughs> again, it's the, the kind of different jurisdictions and the different evolutions that the sport mm. took for a time led to these different methods of trying to resolve it. And a lot of that came from the fact that Japanese MMA had a huge pro wrestling background. And so the kind of the stomping on people on the ground, if you've ever seen any kind of pro wrestling, it's a very common thing to see. That's something that fans expected to see. They saw it. Yeah, right. Um, so I've just got a quick type of guy to throw in here, um, which was a cook I used to work with who was a one-issue Labor voter, and that one issue was <laughs> legalising cage fighting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, there are those guys. <laughs> mm. So this is our little treat. A few people sent me this, uh, mostly with the head... Mostly some sort of not a what on earth is going on <laughs> here. Uh, I am trying to work out if I want to call this the worm or the spiral or whatever. Or perhaps the colon, actually. I mean... I, I mean, I was just going to go with like an... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> does have that kind of energy. So this is a chart showing COVID cases in the United States over time. Starting point is here. And time progresses as you kind of go around. And the reason that this was shown to me is that it makes some interesting aesthetic decisions. The first of which is that as a plot, you kind of look at it and you go, okay, the thickness indicates the number of cases. Fine. So I look at the thickness over time. I say, okay, very few here in the start. There was a bit of a wave here. It got much worse here, died down, got worse again, and then, oh shit, it's Omicron, (laughs) right? Which makes intuitive sense. And the reason I think that they have done it in a spiral like this is that it allows you to go along these lines radiating out from the center and say, okay, so this was January 2021, this is January 2022. I can directly compare the width of that to that. Oh, okay. Fine. Yeah, that's that's not a bad thing to be able to do. It, yeah, it demonstrates, I suppose, you can see seasonality as an effect. I'm not convinced that this indicates seasonality, to be perfectly honest, because, well, like, there is a peak here, there is not a peak here, there is a peak here, we didn't have any information for this because, you know, it didn't really exist there. We're going to see what happens in this range, right? I'm not, this is not the, how I would show seasonality if I was going to show it. There are better ways to do time series than that. But I'm also, this this frustrates me because this here, this short arc, is the same distance of time 
Uh, so this here, which is a much longer arc. And this is the shortcoming of using this spiral setup. Because you have, you can either say you have condensed what is on the interior or you have stretched what is on the exterior of the spiral. In the sense that, like, while you can compare on a straight line what's happening here and what's happening here, that looks roughly the same, you cannot compare the area, what's happening in this half month period, to what's happening in this half month period. And that's a real problem because your measurement of time, the length corresponding to time changes as you move outwards in this spiral. Well, I feel like also if you're going to, to use that, those lines should be much more bold. You should be able to see them much more clearly. <laughs> As in these, like, dotted lines of the month? Yes, th that actually separate time. Uh, yeah, I mean, th this is somewhat of a truncated because I've stuck it on a small screen. So, to that extent, yeah, um, you can zoom in on it and see them a little more clearly. But, like, just visually, without a pen, it could be a little bit difficult to do a direct comparison from somewhere that's off the line. Because, like, you can... Also, it's very difficult for people to compare two things that are separated. So, like, I'm eyeballing this to say, oh, this is roughly the same distance as this, but I can't really tell because they are so separate from each other. So, what they've tried to do here is show that you have continuous time, which is why you don't have, like, it breaking along the year lines, and also show how the number of cases has changed over time. And doing this in two dimensions is hard if you want that sort of thing. The only way I can imagine this being done in a similar fashion in two dimensions, but better, would be instead of having it spiral outwards, you just have a circle that represents the 12 months. I'm shit at drawing circles, so let's try that again. So a similar idea, and then like let's say you have your 2020, and it goes blah zero whatever whatever comes out and then you have you can even do this like a fade transition rather than a strict color transition you have 2021 coming in a different color or whatever maybe and then 2020 sorry 2021 and then 2022 comes around another color so in this case you can directly compare the width because this width to the red line here is the same as the width to the black line because they meet at that point. So that gives you a much better visual guide to what's actually going on in the relationship between these two. And if you imagine we drew uh, 2021, the flare up, so this would be coming uh, in from the start. So 2022 would be going like this, right? And you can directly say, okay, we are much higher up at this peak than, uh, sorry, that's not goes to there, goes up. We are much higher up, because this blue line in the middle represents zero cases, right? Than we were at the same time period in 2021. That is much easier to do that direct comparison. Not as striking an image, we'll admit <laughs> that. Slightly harder to read in the sense that because these lines and colors are directly on top of each other, it can be more difficult to do to read that. Uh, and I'll also but, say that for that one, from an editorial perspective, you're not changing the layout at all either. You are keeping that same footprint of the yeah. data on the page. It's a much better system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't... I, I think that this spiral thing is visually interesting but in terms of an effort to communicate data honestly i think it has some pretty big shortcomings of course if you are doing this in three dimensions it gets much easier because instead of just going around a circle you can actually do it as a spiral directly on top of each other but uh, that's hard to print in a newspaper of course <laughs> so i uh, thank you to the two three people who showed me this in an effort to upset me it fucking worked <laughs> but uh <laughs> I would be interested to see if the New York Times decides to produce anything a little bit easier to read in the future. So, Anders and Bart, thank you so much for coming on today. 
thank you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Where can we f- people find you, Anders? Uh, I am WeMadAndo on Twitter and generally just ramble and rave on there about nothing in particular. Hell yeah. Ah, like everybody else. <laughs> it's, it's a bad... It's a bad site and we shouldn't be on it. <laughs> I, I fundamentally true. disagree. It's a bad site and we should be on it. it oh, would you say it's what you deserve? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Bart, I will yeah, see you next time. Fantastic. See you later.